This, ladies and gentlemen, is what failure looks like. I am that failure. After having spoken, lectured, and rallied at hundreds of meetings on the incredibly important subject on how to combat climate change, in outdoor meetings, in conferences much like this, at the United Nations climate negotiations, I am very sad to say that we have not succeeded. Indeed, climate change is actually worse today than it was 20 years ago when myself and many other climate communicators starting dealing with this issue. So the obvious question that you're going to ask yourself is, why listen to this guy? Why spend 900 of your hard-earned seconds on me? Well, the obvious answer is that I, contrary to many of my friends, colleagues, or partners in crime, many of whom have won much the same awards as myself, most important person in sustainability issues, future politician of the year, which just shows that predictions are always hard, especially about the future. Um, contrary to them, at least I admit my mistakes and hope that pro probably you can do better. Well, you can't do worse, let me tell you that. Let me start with where I started. Number one lesson in communication and marketing. When we reach out to people, it's important for them to identify with us, to want to be us, or even better, to feel that this is what they're aiming for. That's why we have supermodels, super nannies, superheroes. So we, climate change communicators, what did we come up with as a strong symbol for you to identify with the fight against climate change? Well, remember I told you, we're failures. This is what we came up with. The polar bear. Now, unless you suffer from the very rare disease, clinical leucanthropy, subgroup Ursus Maritimus, you will struggle to identify strongly with a polar bear. <laughs> Most of you will only have seen a polar bear on TV and in a zoo. And if you were to meet a polar bear, you would find it hard to communicate in a meaningful way with this <laughs> polar bear. And my advice to you would be to run quickly in the other direction. Now, some of us like to admit our mistakes because even after behaving stupidly, it makes us look smart. So, some of us admitted this was not a strong communication tool onto something else. We found something we felt is even stronger to communicate and let us all feel that the fight for climate change, to stop climate change, is everyone's fight. We came up with future generations. We have not inherited this earth from our ancestors. We merely borrow it from our grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren's grandchildren. Now, isn't that just beautiful? It's beautiful, but really, frankly speaking, what have future generations ever done for us? <laughs> Not much. What are they even going to look like? Will I even get grandchildren's grandchildren and will I meet them? In short, there's way too many questions out there for this to be a strong tool of communication in the fight against climate change. So we went back to the drawers and came up with something we thought even better. We came up with the Pacific Islands of Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and Kiribati. It's a terrible story. These islands are sinking. Well, they're not actually really sinking. It's the ocean levels that are rising. Thanks to or due to climate change, we need to fight that. Now, most of us have never ever been to these Pacific Islands. If we have been, it was usually on a honeymoon, and our minds were probably somewhere else than in the fight against climate change. So again, I think we failed. And don't get me wrong here, I don't want to come out as a cynic. I think it's great that we care about people that we've never met, that we care about places where we've never been. It shows that the fight against climate change is a deep, humanistic fight for all of mankind. 
but we also need to realize that this was not a great way to communicate that fight and get to us all aboard and think that we need to change our daily lives. So then what? Well, then we came up with this simple tool, a thermometer. Remember when we went to Paris to get the climate agreement in 2015, the agreement that's going to shape the future? We went there to protect the two-degree target that, under no circumstances, should global warming exceed two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial times. And in fact, we won. We came back from Paris with an agreement that's a huge success. It says that we should not exceed the two degrees, and it even says that we should aim to limit the global temperature growth to just 1.5 degrees of Celsius above pre-industrial average. That's a wonderful gain, but then we need to get everybody on board to make sure that it actually happens. And how efficient is this tool to get us all aboard? Well, I think not very, and I got at least three reasons for that. Firstly, how warm or cold it was in pre-industrial times, most of us, we don't really know. And we, a lot of us would suspect that even in pre-industrial times, the weather the temperature probably changed. Secondly, maybe someone in here, but it's unlikely, suffers from the rare Wilson's syndrome. The Wilson's syndrome will make you hypersensitive to even very small changes in temperature. But unless you have that tragic disease, you will struggle to notice the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, or even the 3 and 4 degrees that are disastrous. We would need a thermometer to notice the difference. And even when we were to notice the difference, we would not know. Is this climate change, or is it just a warm day? Thirdly, in large parts of the world, including Sweden, all of Northern Europe, North America, Northern Asia, if we were to tell people there's a risk that it's going to become two degrees warmer, I hear the answer already here. Many people will say, that's great, yes, please. <laughs> they will say, I heard that if I don't turn off the engine on my car, if I eat more red meat, we might get three degrees. Now, is that possible? Can we all just agree on that, please? So in short, we realize that this was not a strong driver either. The thermometer, we leave that aside. And then some of us moved on to the next way to communicate the fight against climate change. They went on to guilt and blame. They said, it's people like me, a middle-aged white man in a developing countries with an income average or above average, it's my fault and your fault and your fault and your fault. Statistically, that's true or true-ish at least, but realistically, when you put the blame on someone, that's not usually when they change their behavior. Instead, we defend the behavior that we're already having. So putting the blame is never going to be very smart, and there's also a big risk here. When you talk to the behavioral psychologist, they say that many people move directly from denial to despair. First, they're in the denial phase. Climate change is not really sure. I heard that it might be something with the sun. I heard it might be the volcanoes. There was something wrong with the letters or emails at the IPCC. And then, if we blame them too hard, or if we put too much pressure on them, they move directly to despair. That climate change thing, it's so darn sure. There's nothing we can do about it. Let's just give up and focus on something better that we could that we that where we have a chance of success. I think you hear that I could easily go on for hours about this. And that's actually another mistake that we climate change communicators often do. But instead, let me try and move to a few lessons learned. And the first lesson learned I want to share with you is that unfortunately, it's tragic and it's scary, but unfortunately, and strictly from a communication point of view, 
It's sheer bliss and it's something that we can use. Climate change is no longer some other time in the future. Somewhere else, someone else is going to have to live with it. It's here and it's now. We've all seen that basement or cellar that's flooded. We all know that place that used to be a beach that is now underwater. We've all seen those heavy freak storms, those thunder rains, those pronounced droughts. We all know those mosquito-borne diseases that are now in places of the world where they never were before. We all know that there's more climate-related refugees than ever before. In short, when we want to talk about climate change, there's no reason for us to speak about things that are not directly relevant to you and I. Secondly, I think we should focus on being winners. And I love it. This is going to sound weird, but I love it when people lie about their behavior. Because when they do that, it shows ambition. For instance, in many elections, people are asked after the elections, did you vote? And people say, yes, I voted. And we know that they did not. But it shows ambition. They wanted to vote, and for some reason they didn't. But if we just make it a little bit easier, they're going to vote next time. And much the same thing happens within climate change. People say, I fly less, I take the train more. No, they didn't. They say, I cut down on the meat, I eat more veggies. No, they don't. They say, I only buy second-hand clothes. No, they don't. But they are soon going to do it. There's a behavioral change just around the corner if we just make sure that it's a winning issue. Because people want to be winners. And if they can't be winners, they want to be seen as winners. If they can't be seen as winners, they want to be seen with the winners. So we just got to make sure that this is a winning issue. But we keep portraying it as a loser issue. No change is big enough. No agreement is good enough. Nothing that you do is going to be good enough to impress on me. For instance, the whole symbol of the climate movement, of doing a change on your own, was for a long time getting a hybrid car. Now, if we, the climate savers, the climate communicators, would see you in such a hybrid car, we'd immediately go, why is your car not a pure electric? Then you get that pure electric car, and we say, why do you own a car? Join the shared economy, join a carpool. Then you sit there in your carpool, and I go, why are you sitting in a car? Get out of the car, use the public transport. And then I see you on the bus. And then I say, why are you, what are you doing in a motorized transport? Get on the bike. And then I see you on the bike. And I say, why are you wasting so much energy transporting yourself when you could do all the work just from your computer? <laughs> and by then, we are just a small group left of self-declared do-gooders and world improvers. And all the rest of you, you have long ago left us in disgust. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm, I'm merely coming to my third advice to all of us, and that's to see the co-benefits. We need to face it. We need to realize that fighting climate change is not the top of everyone's agenda. For instance, the, the current U.S. administration, they got a lot of priorities that they think are more important than saving humanity and the planet. And the EU, well, the EU is basically just trying to remain a European Union. So we're looking more and more to other countries like China. And we see that China is phasing out coal in record speed. They're introducing electric mobility, solar power, wind power. All great. Or maybe not so great. Many of my colleagues in climate communication say, ah, ah, ah. They're not doing that for the climate. They're doing that for the air quality. Not good enough. Or they're even saying they're not even doing it for air quality. They're doing it for people to work longer hours, to not be sick so much, so that they can, can increase their productivity. Or they say, they say, the Chinese are trying to trick the expats, people from other countries, to want to work in China. We're not coming unless the air quality get improves. And in the business sector, it's much the same thing. You know there's a big Swedish furniture company, right? This big Swedish furniture company is moving to 100% renewable energy. It's a wonderful thing. Then you ask them, why are you doing this? They don't say climate. They say security of supply of energy. 
We go to the big car company recently involved in an emission scandal. They now go all in for electric mobility. When asked why, they don't say climate first. They say shareholders expect it. They say we made a legal deal, a settlement in the US that demands this. And they say, well, if you want future employees to come to our company, we have to. And you know what? I really think we should embrace all those co-benefits because your co-benefit number one and yours and yours and yours and mine may be different. So it gives us so many new opportunities communication-wise. And then I'm thinking with all these examples, maybe let's just give up. Let's not communicate climate change at all. How about just communicating a better life? Take myself. I used to have several hundred CDs back home with my favorite music. Now I got all the world's music with me all the time. That's a huge climate benefit. We never even think about the climate benefit. We just think about having all the music with us. This is filled with such examples. This thing replaces the CD player, the radio, the TV, the GPS, the phone book, the calculator. Again, I could go on and on and on. It's a huge climate benefit. Just don't mention it to anyone. It works better if we take it for other reasons. I love conspiracy theories, and I've got one of my own just for you. <laughs> I think that the only plausible reason for us not to have won the fight against climate change, with so many great minds, so many wonderful organizations fighting it for such a long time, is that we never really wanted to. Because it's actually quite nice to be a, fight, a fighter against climate change. Everybody loves you. You're like a modern-day Che Guevara or Don Quixote, <laughs> except that you're not fighting against the windmills, you're fighting for the windmills. The only thing, and I would love for this conspiracy theory to be true, because then we would not be communication failures, but just be selfish bastards. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not true. When I meet the climate communicators, we are a bunch of do-gooders who really, for real, care about the polar bear, for real care about future generations that we will never meet, and people in other places that we'll never go to. And that is precisely why you can't trust us with fighting climate change. We need to put that power in your hands. And I am convinced that you will succeed because in front of you, you have the world's best collection of failures. There's no other area that has such a wonderful book of incredible failures. So when it comes to climate change, I'm not worried. I'm sure you will fix it. Thank you.